The young girl carried on with her work, day in and day out. She rose early, she stayed up late, preparing clothes, preparing meals, cleaning the house, whatever needed to be done. She was doing her best to quietly serve in the house of her master and mistress so she might stay alive, perhaps even one day having her freedom return to her so she could return home. And hopefully her family would still be there. This young, young woman, young girl, served the wife of the commander of the army of Syria, a man named Naaman. This was an enemy nation that was, that was neighboring to God's people. And although this man, Naaman, wasn't one of God's own people, he was still considered an honorable man among his own people by his king. God had even given this man victory him and his army in their battles, building up the nation of Syria so that God could use them for his purposes, for his plans. So there's one particular raid into the land of Israel where the army had taken this young girl captive and she ended up in the home of Naaman and put to work for his wife. The girl, as she was working, she heard of her master's bout of leprosy. He, he suffered from leprosy. She heard of his pain, his anguish that it caused him, possibly embarrassment as the commander of the army. You know, he wanted to show strength to his men. And one day as she was serving in the house, she made a suggestion to her mistress. She said, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. This is found in 2 Kings chapter 5. That's in verse 3. Now either Naaman was desperate for this healing, to seek a prophet from one of, the, one of his enemy nations, or he was very trusting, a very trusting individual. And he gave this, this suggestion a chance. He believed the girl, what she said about this prophet, enough to go and ask the king for permission to go. And the king even wrote him a letter. And he went and he saw, or he sought this, this prophet. So the king wrote a letter to the king of, of the northern tribes of Israel. Let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 5 and we can pick up this story. We'll start with verse 5. We see this letter from the king of, of Syria written, a short letter, just a note. Verse 5 in 2 Kings chapter 5, Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothes. If you read the entire story, that comes into play later, but we're not going to focus on that part of the story at all today. Verse 6, Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. Now the king of Israel, the northern tribes of Israel, received this letter, and he thought the worst. He's wondering, why is my enemy coming to ask me to heal him? His reaction is very telling about his own faith in God. This king was one in a long line of evil, disobedient kings who refused to trust God. And like his father Ahab before him, this king Joram, or sometimes it's written Je Jehoram in the Bible, although there are two Jehorams, they're different guys. For the most part, he refused to listen to the prophets that God had sent to him to warn him and his people. Verse 7, and it happened, this is the king's reaction here, when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So he thinks this guy is out to start a battle, to start a war. Now eventually that would happen, but not at this moment. Naaman, he just wanted to, to seek healing. Verse 8, so it was when Elisha, Elisha of course is the prophet that is, has been sent to Israel. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. If the king would have acknowledged the presence of a prophet in Israel, a true prophet of God in the land... If he would have had that thought, that would have indicated that 
He was willing to seek guidance from God, that he had faith in God and faith in God's healing, even for others, not just for himself. But in this case, as we see, the king was more than likely afraid of God. He was afraid that God would bring further curses on him and his people for his disobedience, but he wasn't willing to change. And no doubt he heard the stories of how Elisha's predecessor, Elijah, had called down fire from heaven and ridiculed his own father when he was king, when he was alive. Now even though the king of Israel didn't really acknowledge the authority given to Elisha, it's interesting that this captain of their enemy, the Syrian army, was at least willing to come in person to see if it was true. He came in peace with, uh, with even gifts to give. Although it turns out he wanted to try to pay for the, the healing. He didn't know better. Now as we continue on here, verse 9, we see that Naaman went with his horses and chariot and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. It's kind of interesting that Elisha didn't want to go see the king he didn't want to see Naaman. Perhaps they didn't have that sort of relationship. But also he didn't want to, to demonstrate somehow or improperly demonstrate that any healing came from him. Any healing that comes through an individual isn't because of that individual, but because of God and his power. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times. So so Elisha gives Naaman some instructions. This is what I want you to do, and then you'll be healed. And your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. Now symbolically, this is, uh, or yeah, this is symbolic of, of a baptism, of being cleansed, although Naaman isn't exactly repenting of his sins in this case, but it's symbolic of, of baptism in general. Verse 11, but Naaman became furious. He didn't understand this. He expected that this prophet of his enemy would just roll out the red carpet, welcome him in, and maybe have this, this epic journey for him, a captain of an army to go to, traveling to a far-off land, having to accomplish this task and that task, maybe bringing offerings to, to his God or to some other God. So he's furious, and he went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Some big showing. Obvious. Epic. And he's complaining here. He says, are not the Abana, so now he's talking about these rivers in Damascus, the Abana and the, and the Farpar, are the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. He's proud of his country. He's proud of these beautiful rivers that he has. And he's thinking, why didn't I just go wash in those rivers? They were down the street from my house. They were right there. Surely I would, have been, I would have been made clean. But now he wants me to wash in this, this small river, the Jordan River. It's kind of mucky. It's not crystal clear. Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. So he's angry. Now have we ever reacted like this? Have we ever had this sort of reaction when something didn't quite happen the way that we thought that it should? Perhaps even becoming angry at God because he didn't perform the miracle that we expected that he, he would or that he should or that we wanted to happen or needed to happen. Sometimes we look for these big epic happenings, these big epic miracles from God. But when they don't happen, we become discouraged. Maybe we walk away in a rage. Perhaps we expect that God will save us and provide for us in a big dramatic way like we see Naaman reacting. And Naaman expected that. He expected that. He expected that he would be sent off on some commander-worthy trek, going and washing in these epic rivers. But instead he was told to wash in the Jordan. Now he had to be willing to humble himself, to change his way of thinking, to have faith in this prophet, or really faith in God, stepping out in faith if he wanted to be healed. In verse 13, we see the story continue. His servant, whoever this, this servant was, was looking at it from the outside. His servant came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? So if, if he told you to do exactly what you expected, you would have done it. How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? Something simple. You should still be willing to do that if you are, in fact, seeking that healing. 
And so he swallowed his pride, and he went down, and he dipped in the Jordan River seven times, according to the saying of Elisha, this man of God. And his flesh was restored. It says here, like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. His, his flesh was better than it would have been if he'd aged up to that point without leprosy, just naturally. Fresh, clean, new. And Naaman was healed by God. Although he didn't have, this, have courage to fully commit to becoming a believer, to becoming one of God's people, he went away able to acknowledge God's existence and His power in his own way. Now in the very next chapter, in chapter 6 of 2 Kings, there's another story. There's another account of a, of a miracle. Now this is, some people would consider, a very small miracle that God performed. He did this again through the prophet Elisha. Now we might think that such a small detail might be wasting God's time, maybe wasting His power. But God is the one who chooses who He blesses, and He's the one who chooses how He blesses them and at what time He blesses them. And we can't think that anything is too small or too great for God. God is a God of miracles, including small miracles and the large ones. Now, 2 Kings 6, let's pick this story up. So here we're introduced to, uh, as we are in other, other parts of, of Scripture in this, this time period, the sons of the prophets. Now, the sons of the prophets, we don't have a lot of details about these men. But it seemed that they were being taught by the prophets that God had sent. They'd be, they were being taught the Scriptures. And at times, assisting the, the prophets in their prophetly duties. But they were faithful men who knew the truth. So here we have the sons of the prophets, and they said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. So they're running out of space, and they're, they're going to move. They're going to move down to, to the Jordan River. Verse 2, Please let us go to the Jordan, and let every man take a beam from there, and let us make there a place where we may dwell. So he answered, Go. They got his permission. He is the, the prophet. He's like the, the lead prophet at the time. Sent from God. Everybody knows it. He's been proven to be so... Um, they knew, or at least some of them knew Elijah before him. So they're recognizing his authority as, as students. Verse 3, then, he, then one said, please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. We're not told why they wanted him there. Maybe for, for the sake of safety or security, comfort, encouragement. Maybe they needed help building their homes, supervision of some sort. And so he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. They began preparing, cutting down trees, building their homes. In verse 5, here we come to uh, an interesting part of the story, a detail that's included here for us to read. And we might just read over it as something kind of insignificant. Verse 5 says, But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. And he cried out and said, Alas, Master, for it is borrowed. He borrowed this axe. He wanted to, to give it back. He's an honorable man. Maybe he's thinking, well, I can't swim. Am I supposed to just jump in and get it? Maybe the river is too swift for him. I don't know. But he's worried about having to replace this. And iron, iron isn't something that they could just, you know, stroll down and, and buy, you know, buy a new axe or a new axe head down at the, the corner store or the, uh, the hardware shop store down the street. It was something that wasn't easy to come by. And one of his neighbors, one of his friends, had lent it to him so he could do his work. Now, I'm not sure that this man expected that Elisha would do anything, maybe give him some guidance, maybe console him a little bit. Sorry that you lost the axe head. I don't think that he expected any kind of miracle on his, on his behalf. But he at least knew that he could reach out to Elisha for help as his teacher, as his master. Although God is ultimately his master, this was his, like his, his direct supervisor, you could say. So even in this seemingly significant, insignificant situation, with this seemingly insignificant problem, God performs a miracle for this individual, for this man. Verse 6, so the man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed him the place. And so he, Elisha cuts off a, a stick and he, he threw it. There, in the water, in the very place that the, the axe head had gone down. 
And he made the iron float. It floated up. That's not physically possible. Iron doesn't, it doesn't typically change into something that floats in an instant. Anything like that. And then he had the, the man pick it up for himself. I don't know because he didn't want to touch it. I, I doubt it. But maybe he wanted this man to understand that this, it didn't somehow become lighter. It was still that iron accent. This was a miracle. A miracle that had happened. This axe head wouldn't float up by itself from the bottom of a river. It would sit there for years until somebody picked it up. Or maybe there was a flood that moved it or buried it. We see God willing to provide a small miracle for this individual. And we have to think to ourselves, if God is willing to provide a small miracle for somebody, to show His care and attention towards an individual, towards one person, towards His servants in a time of need, would he also be willing to provide larger miracles in greater times of need to demonstrate his care when we need it? Now, have we ever seen a miracle? Have you ever seen a miracle performed like that? Maybe a large miracle. Maybe you've seen some, somebody's life saved in a very dramatic way or you've received healing. Something that is, that is huge. Or maybe you've seen small miracles. Maybe something that you didn't even think was a miracle. It was so small. Something that you might think it might be too insignificant for God to worry about. But he had worried about it. There are times when God gives us small miracles. He does small things for us. To boost our faith in him. And when we come across bigger problems, we will hopefully be more willing to believe that he can and will help us. And perform even greater miracles as he sees fit. In the same way we need the seemingly smaller miracles, we also need the bigger miracles. We need both. We need both in our lives, and we need to notice those miracles that God provides. Now, continuing on in this chapter, we're going to jump down a little bit here in 2 Kings chapter 6. We see it at a point not too far in the future, the king of Syria decides he's going to go into battle against Israel. Maybe he didn't like whatever reaction came back from Naaman, or maybe he didn't care, he just wanted to take them over. He'd already started having raids into the country, but he began to make war with Israel. Now, of course, we know that they couldn't touch God's people unless he allowed them to. And we see that happening. We see Elisha telling the king of Israel where the, the king of Syria is going to hit next, and so he can avoid that area. Now, God is the one who allowed Syria to gain power that they had, ultimately to punish his own people for their rebellion, to serve his purposes. In verse 14, if we're dropping down to verse 14 here, we see that the king sent, at one point he's frustrated, he sends horses and chariots, a great army, and he surrounds the city of Dothan where Elisha is staying, where he's at. No doubt he wants to try to kill this prophet, or at the very least question him. Maybe try to, to sway him to be on his side. Because Elisha is telling the king of Israel how to get out of the way, how to avoid these battles. With the, the, the city surrounded, we see the servant of Elisha. I think it seems a different servant than in the previous story, if you go back and read that, a different servant. He's, he begins to worry about what's happening. He sees these, these armies surrounding him. Chariots are a sign of great power and, and wealth, uh, prestige in battle. Now, this man, he'd probably seen some miracles in his life. He'd seen God working with the prophet Elisha, at least for a time, for the time that he was with him. He no doubt heard many stories about how God had saved his people miraculously so many times. For some reason, he was still worried. For some reason, he was still worried. He didn't have that faith that he needed to stand firm with Elisha. But again, we see God boosting the faith of this one individual. And this time, through what seems more miraculous or more significant, more, uh, more, more large. But really, God is just, he shows, he shows what power he has to this one individual. But it's very personal, boosting this individual's faith. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city. You can imagine how you would feel if there was an army suddenly surrounding your city or, or your home. 
just outside the walls, just beyond you. Or maybe, you know, if you live in an apartment high above the streets, you can look down and see armies surrounding your building. And they don't want you to leave. They don't want anybody to come and go. So he sees all these horses, these chariots. And Elisha's servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He's panicking. What are we going to do? We can't, we can't flee. We can't fight. What are we going to do? In verse 16, he answered. Elisha here answers in his confidence. He's seen these miracles. He has the Spirit of God in him. He has that strength, that courage. He says, Do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And that's a statement also for us. This is why this is recorded, not just for this individual, but for us to look back. To remember that those that are with them, those that are with our adversary and his army, that spiritual battle, they aren't as much as God. God is more powerful and he is with us. He is with us and we do not have to fear and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. A simple prayer. A simple prayer for this, this simple man to see something, to see God's presence, the presence of his army, his power, his might. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots, not of the armies of Syria, but of fire all around Elisha. This army of angels with chariots of fire, maybe even horses of fire, it doesn't mention. Maybe they go hand in hand. But at least chariots of fire all around Elisha. And now this, this man can have faith in God. He can have faith. His faith is boosted. It's bolstered. It's lifted up so that he can be courageous, so that he can stand firm with Elisha and believe God. Can you imagine seeing that army of angels? If you see an army surrounding your, your home, your city, but then beyond that you see this army of angels, these chariots of fire and these horses standing miraculously, God letting you know that He is there. Wouldn't it give you courage? Wouldn't it give you that courage to stand firm? When we're surrounded by our enemies, we need that courage to stand firm. There are times when God does similar things to us. Maybe, maybe He doesn't show us His armies around us. Sometimes He does. But He does this to give us this similar boost in our faith so that we can better learn how to trust Him, to see His power when we can't see it with our own eyes. He shows us His power. And I think He does this more often than we notice through the miracles that He provides even on a worldwide scale, as we see the fulfillment of prophecies more and more, the wars and rumors of wars, nations rising up against nation, we see prophecy being fulfilled around us. This is miraculous. This is God telling us that what He says is true, that He is faithful to us. He's faithful to His Word that He has written to us, and He's faithful to the promises that He promises to give us beyond the, the tribulation, the wars, and rumors of wars. And there are times when we need to see these, these big miracles in order for our faith, for our trust in God to be bolstered, to be built up, so we can stand firm. There are times when we need that, and there are times also when we need smaller miracles so that we can see God's individual care, for us, his love demonstrated personally in our own personal lives when he answers our prayers, even if it's a small thing in a very miraculous way, maybe a, uh, a small healing, maybe a large healing, maybe just a simple answered prayer when we're struggling with something, a change in our attitude or a change in somebody else's attitude and behavior. But do we have enough faith that even when we don't see these miracles, that we can still believe and trust that God is there with us? Do we have that kind of faith? Do we still remain faithful to Him even when we don't see the kind of miracles that we might expect or the miracles that we've seen before or the miracles that we read about in the Bible? Do we still have faith? Knowing what we know and having seen the things that we've seen, the experience that we've had in our life as God has called us, as He's working in our lives, do we still remain faithful even when we don't see those miracles happen? Let's turn to John chapter 20. I'm reminded of a story of 
one of the disciples of Jesus Christ who had a lack of faith, a lack of faith in his Lord, in his Master, in a moment. Unfortunately, this man is forever known by this lack of faith. Even though later on he believed and no doubt had a greater faith than ours, I believe that. I, I assume that that's true about him. But in this moment, he had a lack of faith. John chapter 20, we'll start in verse 24. You probably know this story pretty well. Verse 24, Now Thomas, so this is, as we call him, Doubting Thomas. Although, you know, I feel bad for the guy because he's known as Doubting Thomas. But Thomas here, he's called the twin. And one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. So he didn't see Jesus arrive. He was told about him. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. And so he said to them, essentially he's saying, I don't believe you. He says, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. He didn't believe that Jesus had risen from the dead, that he had shown himself to his disciples, that he was resurrected. Now at this point, Jesus had already been resurrected as a uh, spirit being, but he appeared to his disciples as if he was still in the flesh so that he could interact with them. Verse 26 says, And after eight days his disciples were again inside, so some time had passed, and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came, to, uh, Jesus came, the doors being shut, and he stood in the midst. So he just appeared in the midst, and he said, Peace to you. So he miraculously appears. And then he said to Thomas, because he knows that Thomas still has this doubt, even though all the other disciples, they've come to the conclusion that Jesus has risen, he's alive, we've seen him. He says, reach your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Now it wasn't that Jesus' body was continuously with holes, but he appeared this way for Thomas's sake. Because that's what Thomas needed to see or wanted to see so that his faith would be, would be lifted up. So that he would have that faith in Jesus Christ. And Christ knew that he had called Thomas to do his work. So he needed Thomas to have faith in him. And so he did appear. In his mercy, Jesus Christ appeared and showed himself with those wounds that Thomas had seen him receive. The holes in his hands. That stab wound from the spear in his side where his blood had poured out. Now, I don't know if Thomas had reached out to touch his wounds. It doesn't say. But at this point, Thomas says that he believes. He says, my Lord and my God. He admits, this is my God, my Lord, my Master, my Savior. But he needed to see that. Jesus Christ could have appeared in all his glory, but he knew that Thomas needed this miracle. Sometimes God gives us these miracles the way that we, we think that we need it. So our faith is boosted. So it is lifted up. So it is filled. Now this is a teachable moment that Jesus finds. Jesus was, was excellent at finding teachable moments. Not only for Thomas, but also for all of his disciples, including ourselves. These, these accounts have been recorded so that we can read them. Because we need our faith boosted. We weren't there to see Jesus Christ with our own eyes. So we have a different sort of faith that we have to have. A faith without seeing. We haven't seen him. We haven't seen his wounds as Thomas did. Verse 29, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Now it's a positive thing that he has believed. But then he continues on, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Those who have not seen and yet have believed in our spiritual life, our spiritual journey, and our spiritual growth, we must get to the point where we have this faith without seeing. And that doesn't mean that we don't pay attention, of course. That doesn't mean that we haven't seen or won't see miracles that God provides. Because God is merciful and He is patient with us. But there are coming times of trial. When we'll need that faith, when we might not see all of the miracles that we hope to see, when our lives might be at stake, and we might be challenged in our faith, in our trust in God. God does and will continue to test our faith. 
that He has built up, that He has given us in the first place, that He has called us to have. He's going to test our faith until Jesus Christ returns to complete our salvation by giving us eternal life. Something that we desperately need and desperately desire. Let's turn now to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Here Peter writes about our calling, the acceptance that we have in, in, in the belief that we have in the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf. This is what we've been called to and he calls it a blessing and he blesses God over it and thanks him for it. 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is the truth that we understand and that we accept, that we believe, having read these things and experienced God's calling. Verse 4, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. This is a reminder that we are focused on things of God, not things in the world, not seeking, uh, seeking praise and, and glory in this life, in this world, but ultimately the kingdom of God. Verse 5, Peter continues on here, who are kept by the power of God, so speaking of us, or the, yeah, speaking, speaking of us, we are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Those gifts of God are, are going to be ready to re be revealed. What we will be like will be revealed at the return of Jesus Christ. Verse 6, he continues on here. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if, in, 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 if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. So he's, he's acknowledging the, the, the trials that we go through that God provides for us to help us in our growth. For the purpose of uh, the next verse, he explains that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Our true faith will be revealed when Jesus Christ returns, and we are working on this faith through trials as it is tested. The genuineness of our faith is like a precious metal that has, that has gone through the fire. All the impurities are burned out, and what's left is pure and honest and faithful and true. And then verse 8, Peter reminds us that we have not yet seen Jesus Christ. We haven't seen His face, and yet we love Him because we believe Him. We have that faith. Though now you do not see Him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We believe what's coming. We believe the gift that God has planned for us, His kingdom, salvation, eternal life. We have that faith. And there are coming times when God will show us great miracles. We'll see plenty of miracles happening around us in this world. There are also times when God gives us small miracles, like that floating axe head that came up. Like Naaman having to go wash in this dirty river, the Jordan River. Something that seems so simple and yet so profound. But blessed are we if we continue on and believe and have faith. Amen. Having in mind those previous miracles that we've seen. Having full confidence in the things that we do not yet see. Full confidence and faith in God and His promises in the return of Jesus Christ. Even though we do not see the miracles that we might not expect or that we hope for, that we pray for, or the ones that we've seen before. But blessed are we if we believe without seeing.